بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We hope and we pray everyone is doing well today. بإذن الله تعالى. إن شاء الله we will be discussing hish. We will be discussing the seekers regalia. We have reached regalia number three, which is the regalia of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fear, the regalia of fearing Allah, um, which is an interesting regalia. This regalia means it's a hilya that the person wears. Um, that is necessary for the student of knowledge, otherwise it renders that knowledge completely wasteful and completely useless. And it actually has no effect whatsoever on the individual. Okay? So this is called the regalia of fear. And where this stems from is the statement that Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid, the author of the book that we're going through, he mentions that if a person truly knows Allah, then the person would properly fear Him. If a person properly truly knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he would properly fear Him. And so he's saying that fearing Allah should be the result of that knowledge. So if a person learns about Allah and then does not fear Him properly, this shows that that knowledge is deficient in some way or form. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ غَفُورٌ Okay, this verse is in Surah Fatir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Only those who fear Allah amongst His servants are the ones who have knowledge. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and forgiving. The word innama means only, right, in Arabic. And so He's saying that the only people from Allah's servants who have knowledge are the ones who actually fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person can have a lot of knowledge, can know a lot of things, have a lot of trivial knowledge, but in the end, like we said, this knowledge is very trivial. It doesn't lead to anything. Okay? That's why, remember, regalia number two was following the righteous predecessors, following the Sahaba and those good generations. And that's because they embodied this concept, which is proper fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in the Arabic, it actually doesn't use the word khawf. It uses the word khashya. We're not using the word khawf, we're using the word khashya. So the word khashya is very different than the word khawf. And if you look, the verse actually says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ That indeed, the ones who are fearful, khashya, not khawf. So what's the difference between khashya and khawf? Okay, this is the question that I want people to think about. There is a difference between the word khashya and the word khawf in Arabic. Number one, the word khashya in Arabic means it's a fear that's based on knowledge and khawf is a fear that's based on ignorance. So if I am afraid of something, a lot of times what we're afraid of as human beings in psychology, we're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of the dark because we don't know what it is. We're afraid of this because we don't know what it is. So that type of fear is a fear based upon ignorance because we do not know. And that's, that type of fear is called khawf in Arabic. Okay? Where khashya in Arabic is built on knowledge of what I am afraid of. I'm afraid of spiders because I know that many of them are poisonous and many of them can whatever. For example, I'm not afraid of spiders by the way, I'm just saying as an example. Okay? <laughs> or I'm afraid of snakes because I know one, two, three about snakes. So if it's based upon knowledge, if you know, and it's a proper knowledge, then of course there would be proper fear as well. So khashya has that element. That's one aspect of the difference between khashya and khawf. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we utilize more khashya than khawf. Khawf is only used when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ do not be afraid of them, but be afraid of me if you are truly believers. So he only uses the word khawf when he was comparing it to how the believers were afraid of the enemy that they were about to meet. On the battlefield, they were about to meet the enemy, okay? And they were afraid. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't be afraid of them, be afraid of me. Indeed, if you are believers. Okay? 
So this type of fear was only contrasted with the fear that they had towards the disbelievers. So that's the first aspect is that it's based upon knowledge. And that's why when we fear Allah, it's because we actually truly understand who Allah is and His ability over us and His power and His might and His wisdom, etc. Number two, khashya is based upon the greatness of the one who is feared and khawf is usually based upon the weakness of the one who is experiencing that fear. So if you say, Ana khayf, I am afraid, the khawf element, it's because you yourself are weaker than whatever it is that you're afraid of in a sense. But khashya has more to do towards what is actually being feared. So with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, khashya is actually best describing Him because He is far greater then we are weaker in that sense. His greatness, of course, is, is beyond comprehension. And that's why with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's khashya that is proper, more so than, um, more than khawf. Okay? So far, so good? Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide, inshaAllah ta'ala. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he says the following quote. He says, the foundation of knowledge is the fear or the khashya of Allah. رَأْسُ الْعِلْمِ مَخَافَةُ اللَّهِ Okay, this is his statement. Because he says this is the goal of that knowledge. The knowledge should lead to this. If it doesn't lead to this, then it's not actual knowledge. This is his conclusion. Which is why for the student of knowledge, they should have this goal, this target in mind. That it should lead me to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. And therefore we have this statement. The truly knowledgeable person is the one who acts upon his knowledge. And no one will act upon their knowledge unless they have a fear of Allah. Otherwise, what's the incentive for you to act upon that knowledge? If I know that I have to do one, two, three in Islam, what is going to motivate me to do one, two, three unless I have a fear of Allah, the one who told me to do one, two, three? And so that knowledge should lead to a fear of Allah, which should lead to an action. And the only reason that I can do an action is if I truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now because of this, they say, forgetfulness of knowledge can happen due to a lack of action. So if I learn something in Islam, I learn ahkam al-salah, and then I go a year or two or three or four or twenty without praying, what do you think is going to happen to everything that I learned about salah before? going to be gone. Okay? This actually did happen. In our masjid back in Utah, we met a guy who was in his 60s and he came into the masjid. He's an Arab. Arab guy. Okay? And he came into the masjid and he was crying. Um, I think the guy passed away actually recently. I'm not sure. I haven't been following up on him. He came into the masjid crying, okay, and his Arabic was completely broken. Now he came to the United States in his 20s, which means that he spoke completely fine Arabic when he came. He didn't speak a lick of English. And he came and after him crying he said, it has been 37 years since I've, since I've prayed. It's been 37 years since I prostrated in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's absolutely broken. He's like, I don't even remember how to pray. Upon talking to him, we asked him, do you even know how to re recite Surah Al-Fatiha? He's like, no, I don't remember it. Okay? And not only this, but his Arabic was completely broken. We had to write Surah Al-Fatiha in English letters in order for him to pray. Because it had been so long since he had done any of these things. So if you think that the knowledge that you have will be protected, if you do not act upon it, Trust me, the experience has been the complete opposite. This man, subhanAllah, it turned out this man had a lot of problems going on in his life, and we ended up, we visited him multiple times. We had to do some ruqya on him as well, and in his house. Um, but he, he would come diligently after that incident, every dhuhr and asr, because at nighttime he said he couldn't drive, it was difficult for him, he lived a little bit far away. So in the daytime he would come, dhuhr, asr, sometimes maghrib. And he would put that sheet of paper, he would open up the sheet of paper, he's like, I can't remember anything. Plus on top of this, he had a head injury, and so the retention of new information was very difficult. But anyways, 
This is an example of a man who you would think, even though he grew up praying, he knew it, all these things, if you leave it after a while, you're going to forget it. And this is why we have that statement, which is, if you do not act upon that knowledge, you will eventually forget it. Think about this, a person who went to Hajj 10 years ago, if you ask him, can you go to Hajj now without reviewing anything, he'll be like, no, I need to review. Because it's been 10 years since I've applied that knowledge. If you ask somebody who it's been 10, 15 years since he's had to pay zakah, do you know how to pay zakah? No, I do not. Okay, we need to refresh our course. Similarly, this, this types of things. So knowledge itself, you have to actually act upon it in order for it to be beneficial. Hey, hey, you too. Hey, you too. Stop. Do I have to stop again? Are you going to stop? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Putting it into practice or into action preserves it due to the following verse. وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ هُدًا وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ The ones who were guided, okay, he increases them in guidance. طيب, they're already guided. How can I be even more guided? And the idea is that if you're putting whatever you learn into action, Allah will actually increase you. If you're acting upon whatever it is that you know, whatever it is that you're guided with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inevitably increase you. And Allah Azza will give them his taqwa, which is the fear of him Azza wa Jal. Okay? Any questions on these concepts so far? Very straightforward. There is an amazing narration. That Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi reports, this narration has nine people in the chain. So you, sometimes we have narrations, there are only three people. Imam Ahmad, he has his Thulathiyat, Thulathiyat al-Imam Ahmad. In his book, these are chains of narration with only three people in the chain. Imam Ahmad was that close to the Sahabi, the narrator of the Hadith, that um, there's only three people in the chain. This chain has nine people. What's unique about these nine people is that they are all father and son. Every single one of them. Here's the chain. In Arabic. He says, Akhbarana Abu Faraj, Abdul Wahhab, Ibn Abdul Aziz, Ibn Al Harith, Ibn Asad, Ibn Al Layth, Ibn Sulaiman, Ibn Al Aswad, Ibn Sufyan, Ibn Zayd, Ibn Ukaina, Ibn Abdullah Tamimi. مِنْ حِفْظِهِ قَالْ سَمِعْتُ أَبِي يَقُولْ سَمِعْتُ أَبِي يَقُولْ سَمِعْتُ أَبِي يَقُولْ وَهَكَذَا إِلَىٰ آبَائِهِ التِّسْعَةِ He says, I heard my father say, I heard my father say, I heard my father say, I heard my father say. Each one got it from his father. Nine generations of memorization. And then their great, 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 great grandfather is the one who was with Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Abdullah ibn Tamimi is... The narrator from Ali, Abdullah al-Tamimi, he was one of the companions, one of the friends of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he says, I heard Ali say the following. Look at this beautiful narration. First off, it shows the care that many Muslims had to teach their own children good knowledge. That each father made sure that his son also took the same chain of narration. And we have this. And this is one of the most unique chains. But it shows this point. What did their great ancestor say that Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu said? He said, Okay, this is an authentic narration. That Ali ibn Abi Talib says the following. Knowledge calls upon action. It either answers or the knowledge leaves. Knowledge calls upon action, meaning you have to do something about it. And if you do not, then the knowledge will eventually go away. You either act upon that knowledge or the knowledge is completely wasted. You will not retain it. Okay? So what are the benefits of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? First off, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ If you have taqwa of Allah, if you fear Allah, what does Allah do? He will teach you. This statement is at the end of Ayatul Dain, which is the longest verse in the Quran, and it's the verse that talks about uh, how to get a loan and how to loan somebody some money. So the beginning is just detail after detail. What do you do? How do you get the, the, the witnesses? What do you write? If you don't have witnesses, what do you do? If it's tijaratan hadratan tudirunaha, all these things, right, are in the verse. 
Moving on, he says, Allah. Fear Allah or have the consciousness of Allah and Allah will teach you. Okay, so that's at the end of the verse that talks about loans, talks about debt. Because it's saying that if you apply all of this, right, Allah will teach you even more. That's basically what it's saying. Because a person will only apply those rules if they fear Allah, right? And if you fear Allah, Allah will teach you even more. So there's a barakah that's going on, there's this cycle. You have to learn it and apply it out of a fear of Allah, but then Allah will give you more. And then you fear Allah and you apply it, and then Allah will give you more. So, what are the benefits of khashya for the seeker of knowledge? Number one, salvation from the hellfire through acting upon the knowledge. What does this mean? This means that, uh, and this is directly taken from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that all of you should know, which is the three people, the first three people that are thrown into the hellfire on the Day of Judgment are who? A scholar who did not seek his knowledge for the sake of Allah. Right, he sought it for some worldly benefit or some sort of recognition. What happens to him? Allah throws him into the hellfire, first person. And he says, why? He says, I learned it for your sake. And he says, no, you're a liar. Rather, you learned it to, for showing off, for it to be said. And it was said, you got what you wanted, and therefore, and he's thrown in. Obviously, that's a person who did not act upon his knowledge. Because that knowledge should have given him a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not seeking that fame or seeking that power, seeking that whatever. Okay? Number two, the benefit of khashya is that the existing knowledge will be preserved. We already talked about this point. That if you act upon that knowledge, your knowledge will be preserved. And Allah Azza will protect you. Which is why that a lot of times we forget things because we actually don't apply them. If we truly applied them, we would remember them. Now sometimes we don't apply them due to circumstances. Like I mentioned the example of Hajj. If a person you know, went 15, 20 years between the first Hajj and the next Hajj, obviously you're going to forget a lot. But that's, that's not a problem necessarily in of itself, right? There's a problem when you forget basic tenets of Islam due to not applying them. And then the last thing that it does is that it actually helps you gain more knowledge. Fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leads the person to um, gain more knowledge bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. This is the end of the, um, the section, the regalia of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does anybody have any questions on fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Very straightforward, very yani, hopefully beneficial insha'Allah ta'ala. Tayyib. The next regalia that we have is the regalia of observing Allah. This is the regalia of observing Allah. This is called in Arabic, Muraqabatullahi Azza wa Jal. It's called Al Muraqaba. It's called Al Muraqaba. This picture, by the way, I took it yesterday when we were hiking with the Boy Scouts. <laughs> um, so, this is the regalia of observing Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay? What this means is that you have to continuously observe Allah. Muraqabatullah. Okay? Now a person might say, how do I observe Allah? I can't observe Allah directly. صح? Can anybody observe Allah? al muraqaba So this is actually taken from the hadith of Jibreel السلام, when he comes to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and he says, Mal Islam, and then the Prophet وسلم, answers him. He says, what is Islam? And he says, Islam is, and then he gives him the five pillars. Mal Iman, what is Iman? And he gives him the six pillars of Iman. Then he says, Mal Ihsan, what is Ihsan? Perfection, going the extra mile. And then he gives him this answer, which is Ihsan, Al Ihsan, and Ta'bud Allah, Ka'anna Katara, Fa'ilam Takun Tarahu, Fa'inahu Yarak. Ihsan is that you worship Allah as if you see Him, and if you do not see Him, then He sees you. Ihsan is Muraqaba. Ihsan, perfection, is being watchful. This is called observing Allah or being watchful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Being watchful of Allah entails two things. Either, either you see Allah in everything that you do. You see His commandment. You see His effect. You see His ability. You see His wisdom. You see all these things. And if you fail to see these, then you need to realize that He sees you at all times anyways. So there's two elements of muraqaba. There's your muraqaba to Allah, and there's Allah's muraqaba of you. 
There's your observing of Allah and His effect on the world around you, on yourself, your family, your wealth, right? The universe around you, your environment, things that happen, your interactions with people. And there's, you, there's Allah's, your realization that Allah observes you at all times. So far so good? This is necessary, observing Allah, is necessary in our journey to Allah. Because if our journey in seeking knowledge should actually be a journey to Allah, right? We're not seeking knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. We're seeking Allah knowledge to eventually reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being closer to Him. Azza wa Jal. Yes. Now, that's a good question. Can I answer that after we finish these slides? Yeah, yeah. Just remind me if I don't remember. Um, so her question was about how do we know if we properly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's a good question. We're actually going to answer in a few slides. Okay? And I'll show you how. So, in our journey to Allah, we have to keep our eyes on the prize, like they say. You have to understand where the goal is. The goal is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a better relationship with Him. Okay? And I say here the word flight because that's what he uses, the shaykh. He says he uses your flight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like that of a bird. And the bird has two wings and you should utilize two wings when also taking your flight and your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are your two wings? Okay? Does anybody know? There's the wing of fear and there's the wing of hope. This is Al Khawf al Raja. Fear of Allah and hope in Allah. And we're going to talk about both of these. He needs, he's saying that you need both of these to do proper muraqaba, to observe Allah Azza wa in your life. And you have both of these wings and you need to balance them. So we have hope versus fear. Remember the previous one was about fear. So this one is more geared towards hope, but in a way that we balance it out. Not in a way that it overwhelms, or one overwhelms the other. Okay? So we understand that Islam is as much a mindset, a aqidah, a belief, an attitude, a dhan, aqidah, okay? As much as it is actions. Because if my actions don't have a proper belief behind them, then they're wasteful. And if my ideas don't have proper actions to support them, then my ideas don't mean anything either. Okay? So, we already covered the wing of fear. The wing of hope means that the person has hope in Allah's mercy, Allah's forgiveness, Allah's acceptance. This stems from a place of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that every believer should do. Right? وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كُحُبِّ اللَّهِ there are amongst the people who take partners, right, besides Allah, and they love them like the love of Allah, meaning they like them as much as they should be loving Allah. Then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Rather, the ones who believe are more loving to Allah than these people are to their idols. Because if you truly understand Allah, you will fear Him. And if you truly understand Allah, you will love Him as well. Allah has given us so much, and we haven't done anything to deserve it. If you think about it. Allah has given us life. He's given us health. He's given us the ability to move around. The ability to see, to hear, to touch, to feel, to smell, to live our lives. Did we do anything to deserve any of these things? Have we paid for them? Did you do any work on your... Nothing. And Allah Azawajal raised you up from when you were a little child and infant. And He gave you two loving parents to take care of you. Imagine if He hadn't done that. How would you end up? And He gave you a safe household. How would you end up? And He gave you all these things and opportunities and, and abilities. And we didn't pay for any of this. Right? So it stems from a genuine love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're just talking about things that are basic. We're not even thinking about things that He has given us extra above other of His creation. Azza wa Jal. So there should be a genuine love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Imam Ahmad was asked, which one should be stronger, fear or hope? He says, Ayyuhumma yaghlib, al-khawfu amir raja. 
He said, which one is going to, which one should I always make stronger? He said, they should be the same. They should be one. It is imperative that they are one. Kilahuma wahid. Because he says, if one dominates, the person will fall. Just like the bird, if one wing is strong and the other one is weak, can the bird fly? Eventually it will fall down to the ground and won't be able to fly. And he says, therefore it is imperative, it is important for both wings to be of equal strength. Now inevitably in our lives, this isn't the case. There will be moments in our lives when we will be more fearful of Allah than we will be hopeful. And there are moments in our lives when we will be more hopeful in Allah than we will be fearful. There are moments when we're happy, moments when we're sad, moments when we're joyful, moments when we're kind of depressed. And because of the difference in these, in these moments that we have, the believer should keep track of their own self to find which one do they need at this moment. This means that you become your own spiritual doctor, <laughs> which is very difficult for a person to do. But the seeker of knowledge, part of that knowledge is that you're able to diagnose yourself before you diagnose anyone else. As a seeker of sacred knowledge, this is meant because you should be able to know yourself better than anybody else knows you. And you shouldn't be going out and diagnosing other people. Like you look at this person like, oh, this person needs more fear. Look at him. This person needs more hope. No. And then you, so on. You can't. This is why you need to do it to yourself first. Okay? So because like we said, they fluctuate throughout the person's life, you have to balance it according to what you see and what you feel and what you hear. Naam. Now, Allah, Allah what? Uh-huh. Yes, Allah's mercy. Naam. إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ فِي كِتَابٍ فَهُوَ عِنْدَهُ فَوْقَ الْعَرْشِ إِنَّ رَحْمَتِي غَلَبَتْ غَضَبِي Allah Azza wa wrote in a book that is with him above his throne, Indeed, my mercy will overcome my anger. This does not negate his anger. But this means that his mercy will always be greater. Right? But I can't just rely on that and say, you know, since Allah is always merciful, خلاص, let me go and do, you know, X, Y, and Z. And um, I'll be fine because Allah, you know, is merciful and Allah ghafur rahim. You understand what I'm saying? Because unfortunately there are people who might think like this. Tayyib. So, here's a scenario. Who can tell me which one I should do? So if I intend on doing a good deed, which one should I... I intend on doing a good deed. I intend on paying my zakah. Which one should I have more of in that moment of paying my zakah? More fear or more hope? More hope? Why? Because what do I want from Allah? I want the ajr. I want the reward. I want Allah to accept it from me. So obviously I should be hopeful that Allah does accept it from me. So in my salah, what am I also doing? Which one do I have more of in my salah? I have more hope as well. Now sometimes what causes me to go to my salah is what? Fear. But in the moment of salah, I perhaps should have, and it depends on obviously what's going on. Sometimes I might be more fearful as well in my salah as well, right? But after I'm finished with my salah, which one do I need? There's a mixture of both. So what's the first thing that we say after you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. What's the first thing that you say? Astaghfirullah. So why are you saying astaghfirullah? Did you do anything haram? Did you do anything bad? Why are you saying astaghfirullah? Yes, to cover any mistakes, any shortcomings that I had in my salah. So I'm kind of afraid of Allah not accepting my salah, but I'm also hopeful that He will accept my salah. And that's how you put both together. Do you guys understand this concept now? There's an element of fear, there's an element of hope, and I have to have both. Okay? What about when I want to do a bad deed? Which one do I need more of? I need more fear. Why? <laughs> in order to stop me from doing that bad deed. Okay? And if I have more fear at that moment, then I'll be like, you know what? No, this isn't, this isn't going to work. I'm sorry. So, yeah, maybe I can't do this. I can't bring myself to do this one. Okay? We do need more fear in those, in those times. Okay? So good deed, you should hope that Allah accepts it and grants you what you want through it. Bad deed, you should fear Allah. That you should fear that Allah shall punish you for it and hold it against you in this life and the next. Tayyip, what about if a person is ill? A person is sick? 
Which one do they need? Why? Right. Well, because they're automatically fearful, by default, a sick person is what? He's afraid. Or she's afraid that Allah Azza might not send the cure, that Allah might not get them out of this okay. And so because they're automatically fearful, they need more hope. Which is why when we go and visit a sick person, what do we do? We, give, we lift them up, we give them hope. Imagine you go and visit a sick person, you're like, oh man, you're gone, khalas. <laughs> Salamat salmak, there's no way you're getting out of this. You know, and just start saying, repeat after me, La ilaha illallah. La. <laughs> you can... Yeah, khalas. Yeah, you start, you start, hey, you, have you written your will yet? Okay, let's go. How many kids do you have? Okay, good. Are your parents still alive? And you start going through his wasiyya. That's the wrong moment. I mean, if he doesn't have one, then you probably need to anyways. But what I'm saying is, you can't do that. And so you, even as a, as a good brother, or a good sister, or a good whoever, you need to go there and lift them up. Be that source of hope. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he would go and visit sick people, he'd make dua for them. He would tell them, La ba's tahoor, inshaAllah. He said, La ba's, there's no harm upon you. Tahoor, which means it's a purification for you. Bidnillahi ta'ala, hopefully in the, by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? So this is what we need. Is that in the moments of sickness, you need more hope. What about in the moments of health? You do need both, always, right? There's always elements of both. But you actually do need more fear. Because you're healthy, I'm able to do the things, I'm able to do whatever I want. I can do something haram, I can do something halal, I can do something that is pleasing to Allah, I can do something that's displeasing to Allah. And therefore, I need to make sure that maybe I have a little bit more fear. Maybe, during certain moments. Right? Yes. Terminally ill, same thing. Because many terminally ill can become depressed long term because of that, that illness that they have. So yeah, I, there should be no difference, inshallah. Yes. Yes. More hope. Yes, exactly right. So that's why, like I say, death and life, right? So the younger a person is, we should be trying to instill more fear. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't give them any hope. We should have hope. But we should try to instill a little bit more fear than hope. And as a person gets older, we should try to instill, instill more uh, hope than fear, right? More hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, hope in all these things. One time I gave a khutbah, and it wasn't even, yani, subhanAllah, sometimes uh, this happens where <laughs> the less you prepare for the khutbah, the better the khutbah it turns out. And the more preparation you put into the khutbah, the more complicated, and sometimes the point gets lost on the people. So there was a, uh, a Jum'ah, I gave the khutbah, and it was, I barely did any preparation, I was busy that week. I just gave the khutbah, and it was about, um, you know, love of the dunya, and, and, and abandoning it, and focusing on the hereafter and whatnot, um, as a generic topic. And after the khutbah, there was an elder brother um, in the community who came up to me, he's easily in his 60s, right? And he's completely in tears, he's crying. And I'm shocked, I'm thinking like, man, there wasn't anything in my khutbah that, you know what I mean, I j it was just a very generic one. I'm not saying this to praise my khutbah, wallah, la. I'm saying that for him, I guess it struck him in a way, and he said, I felt like it was for me, it was talking about me, and I'm very fearful, and he said, I'm afraid now that Allah is going to punish me, I'm afraid now that Allah, everything that I've done my whole life is completely destroyed, everything like this. Which one does this person have more? He obviously has more fear, without a doubt. And so in that moment, and especially since he's an elderly person, we hope that he's okay, we hope that he's good and whatnot. I talked to him like, no, inshallah ta'ala, la ba's, yani, don't worry. You know, Allah Azza wa mercy is there. Allah's forgiveness is always there. You know, and I told him, yani, to not despair from Allah's mercy. Don't give up that Allah can forgive you. Allah can forgive you. Um, and Allah can do amazing things. You have to try to encourage that person, especially when they feel... Uh, down in that case. But I was completely taken back because I didn't expect yani, but subhanAllah yani, for him it affected him in that way. Okay? So if a person is close to death we give them more hope 
And if a person is closer to life and being young and whatnot, we give them more fear. Now this does not mean that it's one or the other. We have to give them elements of both. But there are moments in life in which you do need one more than the other. So if there's a person on their deathbed, right? On their deathbed, what should you be telling them? Not sick, but you know that khalas, yani this person is close to death. Extremely so. Yani they, have to, they have to have good assumptions, a good... Husnul Khatima, which is ending a person's life on a good note, is so important. Because, and the Prophet says this in the hadith, a person could live his whole life as a Muslim, and then right there at the end, disbelieve. And a person can live his whole life as a disbeliever, and right there at the end, he can believe. It happens. And so this is why Imam Ahmad himself, you know, we, we mention a lot about Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, Imam Ahmad, on his deathbed, when he was dying, he, he died at the age of 92. He was very old. Okay? 92 years old. His son, Abdullah, was a scholar. In fact, and in most of what we have about Imam Ahmad was actually transcribed through his son, Abdullah. So Abdullah is at his bedside, at his father's bedside. And he hears his dad. His dad is in the stupors of death. Yani khalas, he's in and out of consciousness. And one of these times he loses consciousness. And while he had lost consciousness, he was saying, La ba'd, la ba'd, la ba'd. He kept on repeating this. Not yet, not yet, not yet. He was saying, not yet. And so when his father woke up, he kept on saying, Oh my father, I want you to say the shahada. I'm telling you the shahada, but you're not listening to me. You're saying instead of La ilaha illallah, you're telling me La ba'd, not yet. What are you saying, oh my father? He says, in one of these instances when I did lose consciousness, I saw shaitan. Look, imagine, shaitan is coming to him even at the moments of death to get him away. At that last moment, shaitan is still there. Because he's thinking, and if shaitan can get you there, خلاص, he got you. And so shaitan came to him while he was unconscious, and he was saying to him, Futtani ya Ahmad. You, 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 um, he says, you escaped me, oh Ahmed. You escaped me. You got away from me. I didn't get you. And when Ahmed was telling him, not yet. I'm not dead yet. When Ahmed was telling him, I'm not dead yet, so I'm not away from your clutches yet. I haven't escaped you yet. And he's looking at him and says, Futtani ya Ahmed. And he's like, not yet. And that's what he was saying, not yet, not yet, because he knows that he's not dead yet. He's only safe from shaitan once he dies. And this is why shaitan, what shaitan was trying to do was a trap, a final trap for him to make him think that yes, he did get away and therefore he loses his guard, his defenses, you become relaxed and then maybe shaitan can get him to say something that's inappropriate or wrong. At that very moment, to trick him. Because if a person ever thinks that, oh, I got shaitan, <laughs> shaitan got you. <laughs> okay? That's one of the tricks of shaitan, to make you think that you overcame him, but you didn't. Because then he can come in, because you think that you're safe. Anytime we think that we're safe from shaitan, that's the moment that shaitan got us. Okay? So this is death versus life. So like we said before, in times of sickness, you're already fearful, so you need more hope. What about wealth versus poverty? So when you're wealthy, you should have more? Fear. Why? Exactly. So you should be fearful that Allah will judge you more. And you should be fearful to cause you to act with that wealth in a positive manner and form. And if you're poor, you should have more what in Allah? More hope that Allah can provide you, can alleviate your difficulty, can provide for you in this life and the next. You're hopeful that whatever difficulty you face in this life, if you have patience, Allah will give you in Jannah much more than you could ever imagine. Right? So it depends on a lot of different things that are going on in an individual's life. Hope versus fear, this is the last slide, insha'Allah ta'ala. We wanted to mention this. Number one, beware of false hope. <laughs> beware of false wishes. What is false hope when we say false hope? What does this mean? This is the claimant's hope. Being a person who just claims, he says, yeah, I, I hope in Allah's mercy. I want Allah's forgiveness. I, you know, I want Allah to give me Jannah, sure. 
Okay. But does this person back it up with action? Can I say I want Jannah without acting upon it? No, I cannot. If I say I want something, I have to also act upon that something as well. I can't just say I want something without acting upon it. If I want something, I have to act upon it. I have to show it in my actions. This is why al-raja yatatallab al-amal. That to have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it also needs an element of actions. I have to do these. Here's a verse that proves this point. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَرْجُونَ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ If you look, Allah غَفُورُ Rahim. It says, indeed those who have believed, and those who have emigrated, and fought in the cause of Allah, those expect the mercy of Allah, meaning they have hope in Allah's mercy. So if you look, those who expect Allah's mercy, look at all the actions that they did. They did jihad. They did hijrah, they did belief, they did all of these good things. Where without those good things, they have no claim to hope in Allah Azza wa If we want to have hope in Allah's forgiveness, I have to do the things that will get me Allah's forgiveness. I can't just say, yeah, I want Allah to forgive me, but then I continue doing the things that I'm doing. It doesn't work that way. Hope has to have actions, al-amal, that back it up. Hope always has to have actions that back it up. So I can't just have a false wish. I can't say, yeah, I want Allah to give me Jannah, and I want Allah to give me reward, and I want Allah to do all these things, when I myself am not doing anything in my actions that will get these things. Those are false hopes. And that's actually, yani, if you think about it, a form of mocking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what this means is that the hope has to be real, and it has to be proven through an individual's actions. Very good. طيب, that's the end of this uh, section. Does anybody have any questions, inshallah? We had the question that you asked before, which is how, do a, how does a person know if they have enough fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the fear, when we say khashya, um, first off you'll know, we said number one, that it will have an element of amal, meaning you're acting upon what it is that you're fearful of. If you're fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you act upon it. Are you feel fearful of Allah's punishment? Are you doing things that are pleasing to Allah? Are you doing things that are displeasing to Allah? You have to evaluate yourself. This is why Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسَبُوا You should hold yourselves accountable before Allah holds you accountable. Imagine on the Day of Judgment, Allah says, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you do this? And he's holding you accountable for every small deed. Umar is saying, <clears throat> you can do an account to yourself before Allah does. Because this will help you review yourself and review everything that you're doing. That's why Umar, he says, حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسَبُوا Hold yourselves accountable before Allah does. وَزِنُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُوزَنُوا And he says, weigh yourselves before Allah weighs you. What are they talking about here? He says, weigh yourself, meaning weigh your good deeds and weigh your bad deeds before Allah weighs them for you, before Allah weighs you. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ الْيَوْمَ عَمَلٌ بِلَا حِسَابٌ وَغَدًا حِسَابٌ وَلَا عَمَلٌ He says, know that today you can act and there's no account. You can get away with a lot of things. You can do a lot of things and there's no accountability. But know that tomorrow there are no actions, you can't do anything. But there's only accountability. You're only going to be accountable. And you can't do anything about that. So he's saying, hold yourselves accountable now, today, before anything else happens. And that's the idea that we have to have. Right? When, when evaluating ourselves and looking into it. Do we truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Remember, our, our relationship with Allah is a unique relationship. So it's built upon love. It's built upon fear. It's built upon wanting forgiveness. It's built upon thankfulness. It's built upon humbling oneself in front of Allah. It's built upon knowing how great Allah truly is. Because a lot of times we don't realize how great Allah Azzawajal truly is. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهِ حَقْ قَدْرِهِ They never properly gave Allah His true estimate, His true due. Whatever it is that we have an idea about Allah, Allah is greater. And we know this. And so whatever we think about Allah, Allah is actually greater. This tells us who we are. 
and how we should behave and how we should react and how we should act as well. There are elements of love, of fear, all of these things. Okay? Very good. Any other questions, inshaAllah? Anybody else have a question, concern, comment? Good? Okay. I think we can stop here, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, next week, same time, same place. Um, Bi'ithnillah, and um, uh, we'll probably finish the chapter um, next week. We'll have a few of the different regalias. Barakallahu feekum, jazakumullah khairan, subhanakallahumma, bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka, wa natubu ilayk.